Hey everybody, welcome back to the Bourbon Note. I'm Greg. I'm Ben. I almost said I'm Greg. I almost just jumped in there with it. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. We don't have time for cuts. And today, we're drinking bourbon. All right, Ben, nothing on the bar yet. And the reason is, mm -hmm. this is a video we've already done, but it was like a year and a half ago. Almost, this was actually our first video that we ever did. And we're doing kind of a redo. Yep. And we're, so the topic is, and you've seen it in the thumbnail, is like top five bourbons, under $30, under 100 proof. But it's also like, how do you begin? If you're interested in bourbon, but you don't know a lot. Yep. This is kind of what we're calling Bourbon 101. So. What's, what else are we gonna talk about today? Well, so like you said, we're gonna have our top five bourbons for beginners. We actually did do that video already. It was our yes. first video, like I said. We wanted to redo it again with a, you know, and kind of just add some more stuff because yes. we've had questions from people. The fun part about doing this show is like you get comments and- Comments and, and emails and- Yeah, and yeah. people ask. And so we wanted to revisit the top five bourbons for beginners. Definitely. And then we wanted to do some topics like what is bourbon? bourbon terminology, what are the things that it says in the bottle mean, um, and just, just things like that to kind of help our our viewers that are new to bourbon and are looking for a little bit of guidance and information kind of navigate their way through the whole getting into bourbon. Because it is kind of overwhelming at first. Because It you, is. There's tons of information. And we're trying, we're going to try to make this entertaining and not too long. We don't want to go four hours or Something Greg's like gonna that. do a backflip at some point. Yeah, that's unlikely. So anyway, well let's, so for the first part here, we're gonna bring out our original five, top five bourbons for beginners. Five so, each. Yep, five each. So we're gonna cut right here. All right, we're back through the miracle of editing and we've got a bunch of bottles on the shelf. Yes. Or on the bar. And you might notice that some of these bottles are not actually bottles that are here. They're pictures that I've superimposed where the bottle should be because I just don't have it on hand anymore. We didn't happen to have it when, we, when we're doing the filming. And this one's a baby bottle. Um, yep. This is going to be a change from the previous video. This is a picture. So, um, well, let's get into it. And we don't yeah. want to take too much time because you yeah. can go back and watch the original video. Yep. So the caveats for this list were... The rules. Readily, the, the rules. rules. Yep. Readily available. Yep. Under thirty dollars, approximately, approximately, and under a hundred proof. We got a lot of flack for not having certain bourbons on the list, but people, where's Wild Turkey yeah, One Hundred and One? People didn't watch the the, the video and yeah. see that like the first thing we said is they're all a hundred proof, under a hundred proof. 100. Yeah, because this is for beginners. This is like you want to try to explore different flavor profiles and find what you like. Yeah, and if you're brand new to bourbon, getting up to a hundred proof, like. It's, it's kind of a punch in the face at first. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit much. So I have a question for you. Okay. So I think some people come to the bourbon world, you mm -hmm. know, they're interested in like learning more, but maybe they know something about beer. And a lot of people are really into smaller breweries. Craft beer. Craft beer that's kind of doing cool stuff. And they, yep. they ignore the Anheuser-Busch and the whoever else is gigantic. Yep. Whiskey is kind of the opposite of that, in my opinion. Now. That's not to say that craft distilleries aren't good. Correct. There's a lot of great ones out there. Mm -hmm. The thing that comes along with craft whiskeys is a lot of times they're a little bit more expensive, yes. understandably because the, they're a smaller company, they have to turn a profit. Whiskey is a terrible business model. It's because, hard to get started. Yeah, because you have to put you know this product into a barrel and, and then let it there. sit for however long. So Years. a lot of times, you know, some craft distilleries will release things a little bit early and you, know, yeah. you don't have the age, it's not as good and the mm -hmm. price is a little bit higher. So when you're first getting into it, I would recommend sticking with some of the bigger distilleries. It's kind right. of the opposite. Like when you get into, somebody wants to get into craft beer, you're not gonna tell them, oh yeah, get some, get some Coors Light, get <laughs> Bud, some Budweiser, yeah. yeah. But with whiskey, we're gonna, we're gonna stick to some of the bigger distilleries. Yes. So let's kind of go through these a little bit quickly. Sure. So we don't drone on too much because we've let's got other things with, to talk Let's address about. this one first. This so, is kind of sort of not, it wasn't on our list. It was the honorable mention. At the end of the video, yeah. yeah. So let's go ahead and address it first. Um, for sub $30, you, it's one of the, I don't know if there's a better 90 proof bourbon for that mid twenties well, price I mean, point on the market. I really don't. But the price varies a ton. So it, it should be around $25. It, it used to be. Should. 
but there are stores that'll sell it for seventy five dollars. Yeah, around yeah. here, around the country, it's kind of different. I've found. Okay, but. okay, but so this is Buffalo Trace. This is kind of their one of their entry levels. They have a little bit lower stuff, but for whatever reason, they've not produced enough whiskey over the past ten years, and so everything they produce is sought and after. And just everything got overhyped. It did. And so everything that they sell immediately goes sky high in price and people overpay. It is a genuinely great whiskey, mm -hmm. but it's not worth a lot more than what it should go for. I wouldn't pay 35 bucks for it. No, I would not pay 35 bucks for it because there are so many other things that are right behind it quality wise. Yep. And personally, I like this one and this one better. Okay. So, but this one we, we kind of left off the, the list because yeah. it's it's just it's too hard, hard to, find to find now. But maybe in some places, and maybe it's getting better. I mean, we did this video a year and a half ago when it was really hard to find. I've seen this sitting on a lot of shelves as I travel occasionally. And we can talk about this later because we're gonna mention some stuff about allocated whiskey yeah. and like hunting later on. So, all right, I'm gonna go with my first one here. This is Jim Beam Black. Now this is actually the one on my list that's different than what I picked in the original one. And the reason for that is the original list I picked, and I'll put a picture somewhere, okay. was Evan Williams Single Barrel, 86 proof, mostly about eight years. Mm -hmm. um, they're still probably available on shelves in different places, but it has, since we recorded that video, become a distillery only release. And, and it's like 20, so, $26. Yeah, so if, if you see it, and you're a beginner at this, absolutely grab that bottle. Yes. But if you can't find that, Jim Beam Black, I think, is a good, you know, it's at the six year, so it's a little bit higher age than a standard, you know, Jim Beam. Yep. 86 proof. And yeah, it's just a good, it's a good starter bourbon. Okay. All right, what do you got on the end there? So, what I, are your I favorites? guess I'm going this way, aren't I? Um, so, in the previous video, I had the Evan Williams Black Label. This is also Black Label, but it's actually 1783. And this is what their, is their small batch, where they, they have the mass-produced black label at, what, $17 or so, mm -hmm. something like that. And this is maybe $20, $21. Yep. Um, but those a couple extra dollars, you get a slightly higher proof, 86 proof versus 90 proof for this guy. Um, such That's a difference. Good. Yeah. This is genuinely a really... So Heaven Hill is a distillery. Their products come across as sweet, almost like s'mores, marshmallowy kind of like flavor profile. Nutty. It works well for me. I love it but some people don't like super sweet bourbon, so that's kind of like the, the mm -hmm. watch out for. But Also very nutty for me, yeah. like especially the Evan Williams ones. Yeah. Salted peanut shell note. Great All prices. Right. Next one, Old Forester 86. I picked this one because Old Forester, if you watch our channel a lot, I am, a, I am the Brown Foreman truffle pig. He likes that. This is made profile. by Brown Foreman. Um, it's just great because it's got such a noticeably unique flavor profile. Yeah. And that's kind of what I want to do here. Well, I've got two Brown Foremans, and originally I had three Heaven Hills. Now I've got a Jim Beam here. Yeah. Um, just to explore different flavor profiles, because that's the best part, is finding an inexpensive bourbon that you can experiment with and figure out like what is your lane. Yes. And so this is gonna be very, very different from this. Yes. And that's kind of the theme of my, my different bottles here. But yeah, like 26 bucks, 86 proof, just fantastic bourbon. Good choice. Next up for me is 1783. This is Barton Distillery. I'm sorry, 1792. Two 1700s next to each yeah, other. Yeah, 1783. <laughs> this particular bottle happens to be a score pick, um, but all of them tend to be what low mid 20s. Yeah, yeah, upper. Well, yeah, 27, 28. I think okay. I usually see them for. Yeah, this list. If we did this list today again, maybe 35 dollars yeah, would be yeah. our entry yeah, point because prices <laughs> go up. Um, but just a great distillery. There's something about this distillery. It's so different, mm -hmm. but it's still bourbony. And so 1783, don't skip it. A lot of people kind of, you know, never try them, and they have some great products at really good prices. Known for being high rye, but it doesn't necessarily come across mm -hmm. as high rye. Spicy. It's got a nice sweetness to it. Yep. So I like that about the, the 1792 yep. stuff. All right. So for one of our uh, drop-in pictures of a bourbon here. Larceny, this is a weeded bourbon. Greg also has a Larceny. So in the previous video, we did a blind where I didn't know what Ben picked and he didn't know what I picked and we pulled them out one at a time and we both picked Larceny. Yep, to be and we list. just didn't come up with a different one yeah. um, to, to replace that. So we both have Larcenies. Larceny is a Heaven Hill product, but it's a weeded bourbon. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into what that means later on in the video in our okay. bourbon terminology part of the video. Okay. But yeah, being a weeded bourbon as opposed to a rye, rye mash bill, yeah. Um, yeah, it just gives you something a little bit different. 92 proof, so it's a little bit higher proof than these other two. Yep. 
Great choice. So you can skip that one. I can skip that one. And now we've got a picture here. Uh, this is a picture of Four Roses yellow label, right? Yep. Well, formerly yellow label. Now isn't it like more of a beige label? Uh, <laughs> yellow beige. Yeah. So the basic 80 proof Four Roses. Yep. So Four Roses is an interesting distillery. And I'm going to get this wrong because I get it wrong every single time. But they have a couple of different mash bills and they have several different yeast strains and they do blending of the different mash bills and yeast strains to create really interesting bourbons. I think so, they got that right. So, Two mash bills, five yeast strains. Right. Um, and the, I think the entry level one is only like two of those mash bills blended together and it's probably not aged super long, maybe four years. The, the main thing to remember for this bourbon as a beginner, is high rye. Higher rye. Which Very high some rye. some people find off-putting, but other people really like. So rye, like, it's hard to describe. It's a spice, and we did bourbons like this one, still have a spice. It's just a different spice. Yep. It's, it, yeah, it's got, you're gonna get some of those clove notes. Sometimes people get like a licorice, like a black licorice. Don't let that put you off if you don't like black licorice. I hate we black licorice. Hate black licorice and like high rye bourbons. Yes. But it gives you a spicier profile versus a, a sweet profile. So, yes, totally. all right, so my next one is Elijah Craig Small Batch. The guy that invented bourbon. Yeah, as they say. As they say. 94 proof, also Heaven Hill. Yeah. This one is, in my opinion, one of the best examples of if you want to tell somebody this is what bourbon tastes like, in general, you don't think so? I would say this. But well, I would honestly, I would give honestly the crown to Buffalo Trace on that for just a good general, down the middle, well-rounded, good tasting bourbon. Yeah. But I, they're both from the same distillery though, the Evan Williams yeah, and the, yeah. the Elijah Craig. So. Yeah, this one I think is just outstanding as just a great, and it's really good. It is very good. It gets some really good. nice vanilla and oak off of that one. Mm -hmm. um, just a great, it's a standard bourbon, but it's really good at what it does. And we haven't talked about it yet, but while we're like introducing like different distilleries and what they're doing, each of these has a line that like goes up. Yep. Like the 1792, they have a bottle and bond at 100 proof. They have a full proof at 125. Yeah, they so have you can a, work your way if yeah. you like that profile. Exactly. Yeah, you can work your way up. Yep, all right, next up, Maker's Mark. I think everyone's heard of Maker's Mark. Super common. Another weeded bourbon. It is a weeded bourbon, but quite distinct from other weeded bourbons, especially Very different. the Larceny. Um, and just really, really good. And it occasionally gets overlooked because it, it, it's kind of like, I don't know if it's like the Budweiser of Burns, yeah, it's kind of but, one of the main, yeah. you know, but Maker's Mark also has a lot of fantastic products, like they you just do. said, up yep. the line. Up the line, yeah. Of all of these out here, I would say the Maker's Mark and the Old Forester, and I would include Woodford because Woodford, and I'll get to that in a second, and Old Forester are the same umbrella company, very yep. similar, Yeah. Um, that have the most recognizable, you can pick them out of a lineup like nothing, is the Maker's Mark and the Old Forester. Yep, and we're going to talk about how to taste and how to pull out individual bourbon notes. Yep. Hey, that's the name of the channel. Boom, like, comment, subscribe. All right, so for my last one, I've got Woodford Reserve. Now this one is flirting with that $30 price point. Yeah. I believe it has gone up a little bit, but some places Probably. you can get this for 30 and under, it may push even up to 35. Okay. Um, 90.3 proof, is that what this is? I think so. 90.4. Uh, four. Um, it's kind of got a similar profile to the old Forester line. I think they're kind of distinct though. Yeah, they are, but they're down, they're in the same lane, but one of them's a little more aggressive than the other. They may like, be on the same highway, but they're not the same lane. See, I think they are. But Woodford Reserve, I, what I love about this one is I, I love the flavor profile. Mm -hmm. um, there's not, there's like the double oak and there's like the wheat and there's the malt and whatever, but just the regular Woodford Reserve bourbon. If you try this and you like it, you can find it anywhere. That Most is true. Bars are going to have this. And the other thing is, if you want to try it, you don't have to buy a bottle of it. You can go get a, a mini bottle. You can get a pour of it at a bar. So it's easily accessible if you want to give it a try and see if it's what you like. Yep. And if it is what you like, then you know, like most places you go, you'll always be able to find it and have a pour of it. So I think most of these, with the exception of the Buffalo Trace in certain parts of the country, should be available. Now, that liquor store may choose not to carry it, but sure, keep shopping. You'll find most of these. All right, we're gonna cut for just a second here, and then we're gonna come back with some bourbon terminology. So first question, what is bourbon? So a lot of times people ask, what's the difference between bourbon and whiskey? And the answer to that is bourbon is whiskey. 
So it's one of those things where all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. That's crazy. And to to reference like the craft beer thing, it's kind of like all lagers are beers, but not all beers are lagers. Oh. All IPAs are beers, but not all beers are IPAs. I it's a, a, I don't want to say brand, but it's, it's a, a cat- variation. It's a category. It's a category. That's what I was looking for. Yep. Stick a camera in my face and I just can't remember stuff. So bourbon, what separates it from like say scotch, Irish, stuff like that. Sure. Bourbon has to be made in the United States. These are going to be just some basic bullet points of what bourbon is. Yeah, not, we're, I'm not going to cover everything, yeah. but the basic ones, the main ones. Yep. Um, incidentally, it does not have to be made in Kentucky. A lot of people think bourbon has to come from Kentucky, and it doesn't. Kentucky did a really good job they, of they, like, they just introducing do, it and being associated with it. And but. they do a damn good job of, of putting some of the best bourbons they do. in the they world do on the job. market. Um, Bourbon has to be made of a mash bill of at least 51% corn. So the mash bill is the ingredient. It's the what, recipe. What the, yeah, the recipe, what the bourbon's made of. So it has to be at least 51% corn. Has to be aged in new charred oak containers, which 99.99, it's a barrel. But yeah. legally you could age it in a brand new charred oak box, I guess, if you wanted to. <laughs> um, so. Bourbon has to be at least 80 proof. Anything below that cannot be considered bourbon. Okay. Has to be distilled to a maximum of 160 proof. That's when they actually just distill the clear liquid. And then it has to go We're almost done. Stick with us. We're getting there. And it has to go into the barrel at 125 proof or lower. Lower. So what did we cover? So we covered the mash bill, aging, distillation, proof. Um, cannot have any flavorings or artificial color. It has to Totally natural. Totally natural. Um, let's talk about aging just a little bit. What's the minimum age for a bourbon? That's a great question that I forgot to put on the list and I'm glad you asked it. So a lot of people think that bourbon has to be at least X amount of years, two years, four years, yeah. whatever it is. Bourbon does not legally have to be aged any amount of time, any except of time. it has to come into contact with that. You could have a clear bourbon that just was in the barrel for a minute and legally it could be called bourbon. It's probably not gonna be very good. But. Right. So 75% of the, well, all of the color and like 75% of the flavor, they say, comes from the barrel. So the yes. aging is very important. The barrel is hugely important. Yep. Now, to be called a straight bourbon, and this is maybe kind of bringing us into our first- Terminology. Bourbon terminology. Yeah. Straight bourbon is something you see on a lot of bottles. But to be called straight bourbon, has to be at least two years old. And if you look on the bottle and you can't find an age statement anywhere. And sometimes they hide it. Sometimes they hide it. If it doesn't specify the age, then it's at least four. Okay. So let's go to the age statement one. Okay, well, you already introduced it. Since we just referenced that, we might as well talk about it now. Age statement is simply how long the bourbon was aged in the, the barrel. I don't know if any of these would have it. So some bourbon, or like Knob Creek has the big mm-hmm. nine on it. Here's the thing you have to watch out for an age statement. Okay. So sometimes they hide it on the on the bottle. Sometimes it's prominently stage, stated aged X amount of years. Some brands like to put numbers on the bottle that are not the age statement. I don't know it's if you have the any of recipe. those. I don't, and I'll put okay. a picture right here. Dickel is famous for this. Famous for batch 12 and a giant 12. Yeah. It's probably or, aged you know, 22 months or something like that. Recipe number eight. Yeah. Or like benchmark eight. Yeah. That is not an eight year bourbon. <laughs> it's, but it's only sixteen dollars. Yeah, it's just the, the the recipe. So a lot of a lot of just like Jack Daniels has old number seven, mm-hmm. but at least they don't just put an, a seven on there. They say old number seven to imply that that's their recipe. recipe. It's the old number seven recipe. Yep. It's not a seven year whiskey. So one thing to keep in mind, just because you see a big number on the bottle, that does not mean that it's aged that many years. Correct. A lot of times actually it doesn't. Let's go kind of rapid fire through these so we okay. don't round, I mean, these don't really need to be discussed too much yeah, at length. Okay. So these are random bourbon terminology that you're gonna see on bottles at the store. And if you don't know what they are, here's yeah. what this is for. All right, number one, it's on every bottle of liquor and this is a, a vodka and bourbon and mm-hmm. gin thing, but what's proof versus percent? What's up with that? Proof is double the percent. That's how you figure that out. Okay. So some bottles put 80 proof, some bottles put 40% alcohol. ABV sometimes. Yep. And so if, you, if you're trying to figure out, like I didn't know this when I first got into bourbon. Okay. I legitimately didn't know this. 
So I was like, okay, I, I, I want, I like that 90 proof one I had. Well, mm -hmm. this one says it's X amount of percent. Well, I don't know what that means, <laughs> you know? So proof is always just double the percentage. Why it's that way, who cares? Yep, it just is, no idea. All right, what's a single barrel? So single barrel is, so when they make bourbon, when they make like a standard, you know, Buffalo Trace, any of the yeah, standard the offerings, bigger, yep. what they'll do is they'll take, you know, maybe say a 1, thousand, 1500 barrels of whiskey and they'll blend them all together to give you a consistent flavor profile. Okay. So Buffalo Trace always tastes like Buffalo Trace. Okay. Evan Williams always tastes like Evan Williams. Sure. And they do that because each individual barrel, depending on where it is in the warehouse, how long it's been sitting there, some of them are of different ages mm -hmm. in, a, in a batch, they can start to get different flavors. A whiskey that's been sitting in the top of the warehouse where there's more heat. They're like six layer or six like floors of yeah, the Rick House. Probably even more. And and Kentucky is a weird state where they get super cold and, and super, super hot. hot. Yep. And so the the heat inside the barrel like affects how much it well, evaporates. And the ones and... that are sitting at the top of the warehouse are gonna get more heat. Right. It's gonna interact with the wood more than the ones that are in the cooler areas. Exactly. It's kinda like if you ever go in the rafters of your garage in the summer and it's, it's 50 degrees more than it is <laughs> 10 feet below you. Right. So a single barrel is exactly what it sounds like. They take one single barrel mm -hmm. and they bottle that up individually. Usually and then they put like that release out. 250 bottles per barrel. Depending on what the proof yeah. is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so a single barrel is just, and a lot of times it'll say on the barrel where in the Rick House it was, what barrel number it is. So I think this particular one says single barrel and it was picked for a particular store here in, locally yep. in Minnesota. So sometimes a brand will release just a single barrel release regular mm -hmm. and then sometimes they have like stores and bars can go in and choose their own barrel that's called a store pick yeah and they can choose their own single barrel yeah and so that actually brings us to the next one pretty easily do you want me to ask you yeah what's a small batch <laughs> i'm just kidding so small batch what does small batch mean practically and legally? Legally, it has no definition. Absolutely nothing. It's marketing. Yep. So you can have a small batch bourbon that's available in every single liquor store, every single bar across the country. This would be a good example. That's a small batch. This is a small batch. It's smaller produce. Well, so what they do, say for normal Evan Williams, they take 1,500 barrels and blend them all together yeah. to make Evan Williams. For the small batch, they'll take those same 1,500 barrels, same amount, but they'll do 100 at a time oh. and put it out. That's their small batch. Now, a lot of brands don't tell you how many barrels their small batch is. Yes. Some do. Some of the craft distilleries actually will say, right. 15. Our, our small batch is yeah. 15 barrels. Yep. For something like that, it's probably a couple hundred it's barrels. a lot. Yep. Yeah, because their normal one is 2,000. <laughs> exactly. So legally, it doesn't mean anything. Practically, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. It's just more of a marketing thing. Okay. Next up, um, it doesn't qualify for this list, but it, it's definitely a question. What is bottled and bond? So, bottled and bond, the reason none of these are bottled and bond is because they're all under 100 proof. Okay. And one of the caveats for bottled and bond is that it has to be 100 proof. So that refers to the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897. So it's a law passed yep. by the United States Congress, signed by the president. I forget who the president was then. President E.H. Taylor. Really? <laughs> no, but E.H. Taylor, there's actually a whiskey named after him. Yeah. He was Pull the guy that here. like lobbied for the BAM, the Bottled and Bond Act. Yeah, and so it was basically, it was just a quality control thing, because back in the day, people were doing all kinds of yeah. shady things with whiskey. They were putting tobacco spit in it to make it darker. They were yep. adding flavors to it. So it was just the original quality control. The main two things um, about Bottled and Bond is that Bottled and Bond has to be at least four years. 100 and, proof. And it has to be 100 proof. It also has Those to be... are the two main things that have to do with flavor. Okay. So there's some other quality control stuff. They actually had to be aged in a government guarded warehouse. So I think that was the protection and make sure that mm -hmm. it doesn't get tampered with. Um, there's a few other things. but tax stamp. So it would yeah. go from the warehouse directly to the consumer. Exactly. So you knew that it wasn't yep. being messed with. Okay. So we've made references to wheat mm -hmm. and rye. Let's talk a little bit about high rye. High rye. So most bourbons, the secondary grain in the mash bill, the ingredient is rye. Most bourbons are corn, 51% at least. At least 51%. Most of them are up in the 80s percent yeah, corn. Yeah, Most bourbons actually, are yeah. very high corn. That's where you get the sweetness from. Um, the secondary grain is usually rye and then malted barley for the enzymes that kind of break things down and create the sugars and stuff. Yep. 
That one's terrible. It is terrible. Yeah. That's why I'm not just... the not the picture that's in yeah. front, but the whiskey that we use yeah, as a stand-in bottle. This is a stand-in bottle. It's from a different company and yeah. it's it's mediocre at best. So anyway, high rye, like we talked about in the uh, the previous segment, mm -hmm. rye is gonna give you that spicy profile. It's not without its sweetness, mm -hmm. but it's gonna give you some of those clove notes, those baking spice notes, kind of that maybe sometimes licorice. And so peppery. I want to jump in. I absolutely hate rye bread, and so I was deathly afraid of high rye bourbons and definitely rye whiskeys, where the definition of a rye whiskey is it's 51% mm -hmm. at least. Um, turns out this is, maybe it is the same like rye that they use for bread, but nothing like rye bread. Right. I, don't, I don't think it's a totally different flavor. But you can, if you want to just break it down to a simple, high rye is usually going to be a spicier profile. That's kind of the easiest way to sort of just break it down. If somebody just said, hey, what's the difference between high rye and a weeder? You know, which brings us to weeded. What's weeded? We talked about that with the Maker's Mark yep. and the Larceny. That's when they replace the rye as the secondary green with wheat. So then it's corn, mm -hmm. wheat, malted barley. Yes. Typically known for giving you a sweeter profile. But it still has a bit of sweetness or a bit of spice. Bit of spice. Yeah, it's not without its spice, but yeah. Weeders, especially Maker's Mark, has a real bready, we always say kind of like almond shortbread. Almond bread. shortbread, biscotti yep. kind of flavor profile. But yeah, Weeders and then wheat whiskeys in general, which is different than bourbon, that's where it's primarily wheat. Yeah. Um, that's sometimes where you get that bubble gum note. <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't look for that in all weeded bourbons. Right. I mean, it might be there, but not all of them have it. Yep. But yeah, typically weeded bourbons are known for giving you a little bit of a softer edge and a little bit of a sweeter profile. And maybe more of a beginner slash approachable flavor. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely love some weeded whiskeys and they also make weeded whiskeys at 90 proof, 100 proof, 110, 120. 100, oh yeah. You know, yep. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Two more categories here. Well, so we mentioned that typically bourbon is, has three grains. They all seem to have malted barley as about 10%, kind of like just to blend, like to round yeah, out the like flavor profile. It breaks down the starches and yeah. converts them to sugars yep. and But there science. is this other animal that's a four grain. Yep. Sometimes it has wheat and malted, wheat, or wheat and uh, rye. Yeah, exactly. And then there's this other crazy monster that has rice, brown rice in it which is also kind of interesting. You don't yeah. see a lot of those, but. That's just the one. <laughs> yeah, well, so far. <laughs> yeah, so there are four grain bourbons. There's some that are up to nine grains. They're exactly. not common, but yeah. that's more of a niche sort yeah, of thing. Definitely. So. Probably not in the price range of most of these, I would think. No, not at all. Yeah. All right, next up, cask strength or cask. Cask strength. So cask strength basically just means whatever the whiskey comes out of the barrel at, after, aging at, after the, aging, at the end, as it's going into the bottle, to the store, yep, to your car, drive home, to your house. <laughs> Thank you for that. So <laughs> cask strength is, it's either cask strength, barrel proof, um, final A or final... Cask strength yeah. and barrel proof is usually the, the, the two that, yep. yeah, they're the same, they mean the same thing. And it just means, so like, when whiskey comes out of, say, say when Buffalo Trace comes out of the barrel, it's not 90 proof. Because it was put in there what? at whatever high proof it was. Around 125 is the max. Yep. So, so they put it in something close to that. It, Most of them do 125. Or yep. Close to that. Occasionally you get more they don't disclose that. that, that it, yeah. For some distilleries, it's private. Yep. But. So whatever the proof of the whiskey is, when it comes out of the barrel, that's cask strength. So what would cause that to be anything other than the proof that it went in at? Evaporation. Or angel's share. Well, that's what they and call it. That refers to the evaporation of water and alcohol during the aging process. And that can be up to like a certain percentage. I can't remember what it is, but every barrel that sits in ages, and especially the longer it sits in ages, they're going to lose a certain percentage of the liquid in there to evaporation. So when you visit a distillery, specifically a Rick House mm -hmm. in Kentucky in the heat of summer, it smells like bourbon. You're smelling evaporation. Sure. So. Whether or not, like, you can have a bourbon go into the barrel and come out a higher proof than it was when it went in. Yeah. Because more water has evaporated than alcohol, or vice versa. So, basically, the high, or the cast strength or barrel proof, they just take the bourbon as it is, 
and that's the proof you get. Yeah. Now, when they make a mass produce one at a specific proof point, whatever it comes out as, they add whatever amount of water they need to bring it down to that specific proof. Correct. So cask strength and barrel proof are always gonna be the higher proof so there's also something called full proof, like this 1792 full proof. Mm -hmm. Full proof is very similar. It's a higher proof one, but full proof refers to it's the finished product is bottled at the same proof that it goes into the barrel as. Yes. So next up is, you mentioned it. Let's talk about finished. Finished whiskeys. So, or finished bourbon. bourbon. So let's focus on bourbon. So you cannot add flavors to bourbon and still call it a bourbon. Correct. Can't add anything else to it. One thing you can do, and I think you have to specify on the label. It's a little bit of a gray area, gray area. If, if we're honest. You can finish a bourbon, and what that is, and it's fairly common, Yes. that's when you take an already aged bourbon, and when you're done with it, when it's done aging, you pour it into a used barrel of, like say, a wine barrel, for a wine example. Barrel. And we call that a port finished. Bourbon. If it's, yeah, if it's yeah, a port if, if wine, it was a port. if it's a sherry cask, it's yeah. a sherry finished bourbon. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times um, different companies will actually do that. They'll take their bourbon. Yeah, absolutely. It's ready to be, or it's already done aging, mm -hmm. and then they pour it into a used wine barrel. Sometimes places get really creative. They'll use ex rum casks. Yep. They'll use Cognac apricot casks. brandy casks, yep. things like that. For the most part, it's wine barrels For the most are the part. most common ones. Yep. But it has to be an already aged bourbon. You can't age a raw whiskey in a wine barrel and still call it bourbon because it has to be a new charred oak yeah. container. And it needs to be, it, it needs to say on the bottle that it's finished in something. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's. So it has to be bourbon whiskey finished in whatever. You can't just finish it in a different <laughs> barrel and just call it bourbon and not specify yeah, exactly. that. Yeah. The other thing that's not on the list is a double oak, which is similar, but there's a couple of companies that do a double oak bourbon. That's basically when they just take a bourbon age it in a new charred barrel yes. for X amount of years, and then they transfer it to another new charred barrel. Woodford is famous for their double oak that is yep. amazing. And Old Forester, 1910, oh, yep. Um, both of which come across as very... Um, they're a completely different animal. Well, they're different from each other, but it adds, as you would expect, a lot of the wood profile to mm -hmm. the whiskey. It adds something different though, yeah. too. Like it, it's, they're it's, really, really different. It is. Definitely. So if you see a double oak, that's what that means. Yeah. So, well, that brings us to the conclusion of the bourbon terminology. If you're still here, you must really want to learn about bourbon. Absolutely. Bourbon's awesome. We're going to cut for a second, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about hunting bourbon and collecting bourbon a little bit. And we're back. For our final segment here, yes. we want to just talk very, very briefly. I know it's been a long video, but talk about bourbon hunting and collecting. So if you're first getting into bourbon, you may be going on YouTube or going on you know, Facebook and getting into some whiskey groups and stuff like that. And you see people posting pictures of you know, rare, allocated. Amazing looking bottles. Yeah. And you're like, I got to have me one of those. Well, and the thing is too, is like when you first get into it, you see, oh, well this one bottle keeps getting posted all the time. Must be a great bourbon. I need to get that one. Let's talk about this one right off the bat. <laughs> this is, <laughs> so the amazingness it is. Blantons. So this we're gonna use as the example I'll set of. It up let's, here. I'll just set yeah, it there up you here. go. As the example of. This is an allocated bourbon. What that means is, you know, different states get different amounts that they're allowed to have. It's rare. It's in short supply, and. They can't just make more because it's aged like nine years. Yeah. And so like they would have had to have planned for this demand nine years ago when they didn't. You know, well, I think this is only like six, well, but either yeah, way. Yeah. The other thing is I think they like having their products oh, rare and yeah, they don't want them sitting on the, sitting on the shelf. So but. our point is that we just want to talk very briefly, like if you're new to bourbon and you're just getting into this, don't go on Facebook and see like, oh, these are the cool rare bottles. I have to go find those. And if I don't get them in my collection, my collection sucks. That's not the case. 90% of my collection is not stuff like this. It's available in almost every liquor store. Yep. Now I do have some rare ones that I've been lucky enough to get, gotten in a couple lotteries. I've been lucky a couple times yep. and stumbled upon things, yep. but I've never paid well over retail price. People sell this online for $250. Or this more. is a $65, $70 bottle at retail, and it is absolutely not worth a penny more than that. And what you're gonna find, let's look. 
This is like a six year. It's a 93 proof. It doesn't have the age, but yeah, they're known for yeah. being six years. Six 90... to seven years, yeah. Nin 93, 93 proof. It is comparable to a lot of the whiskeys up here mm -hmm. in the $30 range. Absolutely. You know, it's it's decent. It, it may like it may come in first place if we ate, if we tried all of these. I don't think it would. But it's not gonna blow it away. No, not at all. It's it's nice. I'm glad I own one or two bottles. But absolutely don't pay the, I mean, I think $65, $69 is its normal yeah, price. Yeah, I'll buy one because, yeah. I mean, there is the, the rarity factor yep. where it's and like, if I have a chance to get one, like yeah. Eagle Rare is another one that's kind of rare. Here, I'll bring one of these out. This one here, this is another great whiskey, but people get ripped off on this one. Not quite as bad as they do with Blanton's, Yeah. but you're not gonna see this on the shelf for the most part. But this should be in that $30 range for the most part. To 40, it's gone up a but, bit. And... I mean, paying 45 bucks for this, I don't mind that. It's a 10 year bourbon. It's yeah. a great, great quality whiskey. It is very good. Don't go beyond that, right. you know? Don't pay $200, you know, on some Facebook marketplace scam. Yep, it's... and we could go on and on. The yeah. Wellers, the Pappy Van Winkles, obviously. Right. There's some bottles that retail for 100 bucks and they sell for 15, 1600 bucks on the internet. Yeah. Please do not fall into that trap. Exactly. A, don't support people that are doing that. Yes. And B, don't get ripped off because none of the whiskey in that bottle is worth it. Totally there are great. some great, great allocated whiskeys. But, you know, whiskey is meant to be drank. It spends all this time in the barrel. Don't make it spend all that more time in the, in the bottle. You know, I mean, if you want to save your whiskey for a special occasion, great. If you want to have a backup sure. bottle and save it, great. But, you know, at the end of the day, whiskey was meant to be drank. So, I don't know. I mean, do what you want with your bottles. I'm not here to tell you not to, not to save them or have a collection. But in my opinion, cracking that bottle open and having a memory with a friend is so much more valuable. Totally. It's a community thing. Yeah, exactly. And that, an that's experience. why like, all my rare bottles are open. And I love it when I have a friend that comes over that's into bourbon or maybe just getting into bourbon. They're like, holy crap, you've got a bottle of that. I've never seen that. Yeah. Have a pour, yeah, and you totally. get to you get to share that with somebody who otherwise wouldn't get a chance to have it. Totally. So, but yeah, when you when you're looking at starting your collection, start with the basic stuff. Find out what you like, and then explore some just some brands that you can find on the shelf. You do not have to have rare whiskey in your collection to have a great collection. Totally agree. So just don't hang your hat on that, and you know all the stuff you see on Facebook. You know, it's cool if somebody gets a bottle, but. Every time I see that, it's like somebody like, hey, I went out bourbon shopping today and I bought a X, Y, and Z. There's five bottles that you've never seen. It's like, yeah, you paid $3,000 for those exactly. bottles. You're That's an idiot. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. So anyway, in short, yeah, just, just buy good whiskey. Don't worry about you know what it means, what other people think, and share it with your friends and family. I mean, that's what it's really for. Totally you know? agree. So if you are still here watching, thank you very much. We hope this has been really helpful for our uh, viewers that are new into bourbon interested in bourbon yeah and yeah some of the details and so yeah we look forward to uh seeing your comments and and maybe seeing you pop up in the live chats in the future absolutely all right well this has been bourbon 101 i'm ben i'm greg till next time see you next time <laughs>